Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us for this installment of the Young Scientist webinar series. Uh, tonight, we'll be hearing from Jeffrey Walker on traveling tuna using genetic approaches to understand stock structure of Pacific albacore. Our next uh, presentation for this series will be next February 8th, uh, also a Tuesday evening, and we will be hearing from uh, Shu Min Sai, also goes by the name of Janet, and she will be talking about uncovering the impacts of environmental identities and worldviews on early, early adolescents' perceptions and awareness on local marine reserve issues. I'd like to acknowledge that uh, the Cape Perpetua area landscape from Yahats to Florence is the traditional territory of the Siletz tribe and Coos, Lower Umpqua and Sayuslaw tribe, and that the tribal governments and, and acknowledge the roles that the tribal governments historically and today have taken in caring for these lands. And you can find more information out about these tribes um, on their respective websites. A little bit about the Cape Perpetual Collaborative. My name is Tara Du Bois. I'm the communications coordinator for the Collaborative, and it's a pleasure to coordinate and host this series. Uh, the Collaborative's vision is to foster conservation and collaboration within local communities for scientific exchange, management, awareness, and stewardship from the land and sea in and around the Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve. And our three guiding principles are community engagement, leveraging resources, and engaging in partnerships. And the logos at the bottom here, there's quite a few of them. These are our founding partners who came together to form the collaborative back in 2017. Um, but I also want to acknowledge that we have many other uh, partners, local um, partners that without the work of any of our partners, uh, this work that we couldn't uh, put forth this effort. So um, it's made possible by all of our partners and I'm grateful to them. A little bit about the Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve, since that's the focus of the collaborative. Uh, there are five marine reserves in Oregon and the Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve is the largest marine reserve. Um, and with the marine protected areas to the north and south, there are some form of protected waters that stretch between Yahats and Florence. Um, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife is the management agency of the marine reserves in Oregon. And you can find out more about their uh, work or um, the collaborative on the collaborative website at capeperpetualcollaborative.org. And on the site, you'll also find an events calendar uh, where you'll see all of our events and presentations posted. Um, you can see here, we, we do a, quite a bit of community science. Many of that uh, takes place seasonally, uh, like uh, summer and fall or spring. Um, we do host monthly beach cleanups year round. Um, and in addition to this speaker series, we also host a Cape Perpetua speaker series on Saturday mornings um, at 10 a.m. And I also like to encourage folks to join up on inaturalist.org. You can download an app and join the Cape Perpetua BioBlitz series, and that will help us document biodiversity in the area. Um, again, you can find out all this information on our website at capeperpetualcollaborative.org. Like to encourage you to visit us on our Facebook and our YouTube page. And if you like the work that we're doing and you feel inclined, um, you can donate. And there's a donate button on our website. If you click that, it would take you through the steps. And with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker for the evening. Jeffrey Walker is a graduate student in the State Fisheries Genomics Lab under the supervision of Dr. Kathleen O'Malley. He received a BS in genetics from Purdue University and spent a semester at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand, where he was introduced to marine conservation and fisheries management. His research interests involve using genetic techniques to preserve marine biodiversity and manage sustainable marine fisheries. Outside of the lab, he enjoys hiking, playing video games, and watching college sports. And with that, Jeffrey, I will stop share and you can pull up your screen. Um, and while Jeffrey's bringing up his presentation, I just wanna let the audience know that we will do a Q&A session at the end of uh, his presentation. So if questions come up throughout, you're welcome to include those in the chat or the Q&A box and we will do uh, answer those at the end. Jeffrey, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you for the introduction, Tara. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. As you mentioned, my name is Jeffrey Walker. 
and I'm a, I'm a graduate student in the State Fish Fish Genomics Lab at Oregon State University under the supervision of Dr. Kathleen O'Malley. And today I will be talking about my research using genetics approaches to understand stock structure of Pacific albacore. And so I'm going to start off by giving a background of um, albacore and what we know about their distribution. And then I'm going to talk some about the genetic techniques and how those can help us learn more. And lastly, I'll go into the research that I'm doing for my master's thesis. So albacore tuna are a highly migratory species found throughout most of the world's oceans, including right here in the Pacific. And what I mean by highly migratory is that they're capable of taking annual migrations um, that span the width of the Pacific Ocean. So think from the United States to Japan or vice versa. And that's in the course of one year. And something that I think surprises a lot of people that see the uh, that mostly think of albacore as a canned good in the grocery aisle is that they're actually a predator species near the top of the food chain. And so you can see uh, up here in this picture on the top right that they're kind of designed like a torpedo shape, which helps them move through the water. And one fact I find really cool about them is that they actually have a notch on the side of their bodies that these pectoral fins can fold into, which reduces water resistance and makes them even faster. And they use the speed to hunt smaller fish out in the open ocean. So albacore are commercially a very valuable species. They're high in protein, high in omega-3 fatty acids, and of course, very tasty. Uh, but they also support recreational fisheries as they're a lot of fun to catch. Uh, they're prized sport fish for recreational anglers. And despite all this interest, uh, given the data that we have right now, we do believe that they're being sustainably harvested and they're, that they're not currently at risk of overfishing in the Pacific Ocean. In Oregon, the albacore season begins in early summer when warmer waters bring the schools closer to shore. So in this graph here, uh, this shows the pounds landed in Oregon's commercial albacore fishery throughout 2019. So you can see the catching begins around July, peaks in August, and then slowly decreases throughout September and ends in October uh, when the cooler waters come back and the fish once again swim offshore for the year. Despite only being here for a limited amount of time, they still represent a very important part of Oregon's commercial fisheries. As you can see here, in 2019, they were the fifth most valuable commercial fishery in Oregon, with over 6.5 million pounds landed and over $10.8 million in revenue brought in. And this can change a lot from year to year based on a variety of factors, including uh, ocean conditions and the size of the albacore that year. And I decided to use the data from 2019 for this because, as we all know, 2020 was an odd year for a number of reasons, and the data from 2021 is still coming in. However, some of the early data from 2021 suggests that it was a severe down year for albacore across the West Coast, with less than, with about half of the uh, average pounds landed over the last three years. And we don't know if this is a cause for concern yet, or if this is just an unusual year that's going to bounce back soon. Oregon also supports a very strong recreational albacore fishery, both with private boats and uh, fishing charters. So in this graph here, the albacore catch is listed in uh, dark blue. And so you can see a lot of that annual variation I talked about. And you can see that 2019 was a really great year for albacore with about 100,000 fish caught. And this was greatly in part to the warmer water coming extra close that year, which is even more important for recreational vessels uh, in terms of how far out they have to go to catch the fish. And even though there was an increase in the fishing effort, the total amount of albacore or landed per trip went up to about 6.5, much higher than the four or three in the previous years. But the US isn't the only country that's fishing these albacore. In fact, it's only a small portion. This graph here shows the contribution from many different countries to the albacore uh, fishing in the North Pacific Ocean. And so what you can see is that the United States is in green here. And over the years, it's only accounted for a small portion of the fishing at about 18%. Uh, the main contributor by far is Japan with a whopping 65% of the total albacore uh, poundage landed. Other countries like China, Canada, and Mexico fill out the remainder of the harvest. And with all of these different countries fishing the same stocks, uh, it's really important to have international cooperation so that they can make sure that they're fishing them sustainably sustainably together. This cooperation comes in the form of regional fishery management organizations, or RFMOs, 
And these are essentially just international agreements on fishery management. And so uh, member countries will send delegates and they'll decide on um, regulations to implement. And then in the US, uh, NOAA is responsible for implementing those regulations so that we meet our obligations to the management agency. In the Pacific Ocean, there are two RFMOs dedicated to managing tuna, and that's the Inter-American Tropical Tuna Commission, or IATTC, and the Western Central Pacific Fisheries Commission, or WCPFC. And here's a map of the jurisdiction of each of those RFMOs. So uh, anything east of, the, of this uh, dashed line is under the jurisdiction of the IATTC, and anything west of the red line is under the jurisdiction of the WCPFC. And another thing this map shows is the exclusive economic zones of uh, various countries that are members. And one thing you'll notice is the US economic zones listed in green are actually found in both of these um, RFMO territories. And that's because the US has many territories uh, throughout the Pacific Ocean. So the US and other countries are often uh, members of both of these management groups and contribute to both of them. And one kind of interesting thing you'll notice here is that there's actually a rectangle of overlap, which uh, occurred when these were founded. So the IATTC decided on a hard border at 150 degrees, while the WCPFC decided to try to include some more of these uh, Pacific islands and extended their border out to 130 degrees. And so any participants within this overlap zone, as it's called, is uh, they get to decide which one of these regulations they follow. So here's a map of how albacore are distributed in the Pacific Ocean. Um, the shaded areas indicate the species range and the arrows indicate the uh, proposed migration routes. And uh, it's important to note that because of the highly migratory nature of these fish, how many there are constantly moving throughout this range, uh, it's really difficult to get accurate distribution data. So while this is based on the best information we have, there's still a lot of uncertainty involved. So you can see Oregon up here is within the range of the uh, immature or juvenile albacore uh, shaded in white. And if you've ever seen locally caught albacore here, they're smaller than what you'll find elsewhere. But those smaller fish are richer in omega-3 fatty acids and lower in mercury. So there are some benefits to that. And these smaller fish tend to um, prefer the colder waters in the north, like up here, and in the south near uh, New Zealand, in the South Pacific. Um, the other thing you'll notice is that there is a big uh, gap here around the equator. So generally speaking, there's very few albacore actually caught here by uh, fishing boats. And so that's led people to believe that they mostly tend to stick to one side or the other. And this is possibly because of the warm water around the equator. But some people have proposed that it's possible the fish just swim deeper to avoid the warm water when they pass through the equator, and that's why they're not being caught. Some tagging studies have looked to track the albacore to see where they migrate, and so far they haven't definitively shown migration across the equator, but with so few tags, it's difficult to be certain. So uh, given this information, albacore managed as two stocks, one in the North Pacific and one in the South Pacific, uh, separated by the equator. But there's still questions that remain. Does the warm water of the equator serve as a barrier to migration? And if so, how frequently, or if not, how frequently is migration taking place and should that affect the way that we manage these fish? Now, one thing you might've noticed is that even though the fish are organized into stocks in the North and South Pacific, they're being managed by groups in the East and the West. And um, it's important to know that there, these RFMOs are managing multiple tuna species and there's other, other socio-political factors that go into forming them. So I'm not trying to say that this is mistaken management, but rather I'm trying to highlight the difficulty of managing these highly migratory species. When you have to coordinate their uh, biological distribution, uh, many harvesting countries and multiple different uh, management groups. Therefore, it's important to have as much information as you possibly can about the distribution of these fish so you can make accurate management decisions. So, how can genetics help us learn more about their distribution? Here, I'll just talk about a couple of genetic concepts and tools that we use to learn more. So in this example, let's say we have two groups of fish and we don't know if they belong to one big mixing population or two separate ones. In this situation, it can be useful to look at genetic structure 
which is a pattern in the genetic makeup of a population. So if these are in fact two separate groups, they're going to slowly accumulate differences in their DNA over time that'll allow you to tell them apart. Now, while they'll be uh, identical to the naked eye, using genetics and looking at their genetic composition, you can tell that they're two separate groups and that is their genetic structure. Genetic connectivity, on the other hand, is the contribution of genetic material from one population to another. So another way of thinking about that is if a fish were to travel, say from population two to population one and then breed there, it would be introducing DNA from population two into population one and therefore making these two groups uh, more similar genetically. And that transfer of genetic material is genetic connectivity. So when genetic connectivity is low, uh, these differences accumulate and these groups are easy to tell apart. So there's clear genetic structure. But if genetic connectivity is high, then there's a lot of DNA being transferred between these populations and uh, it can be uh, difficult to tell them apart. So genetic structure is not as clear. Next, I'll go into just a little more detail about uh, how we look at their DNA and uh, find the differences between these groups. So let's say we take one fish from population one and one fish from population two. Now, if you look at the DNA of these fish, most of it is going to be identical because they are from the same species. However, there are going to be certain uh, variable sites on the DNA that accumulate changes over time, like I mentioned. And these variable sites are single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. Now, if you look at a lot of different fish, you can start to see that certain SNPs are associated with one population or the other. So for this example, red SNPs are associated with population one and blue SNPs are associated with population two. However, one SNP isn't enough to tell you where a fish came from. Instead, we look at hundreds or even thousands of SNPs to get a consensus on uh, which population the fish originated in. So you can see in this example, I did include one blue SNP in the fish from population one, just to illustrate the fact that while a SNP is associated with a population, that association isn't 100%. And it's possible that a fish from population one could have a SNP that suggests it might be from population two. So that's why we look at the consensus. Because this fish overwhelmingly has SNPs that are associated with population one, we can conclude that the fish likely originated in that population. Similarly, fish two likely originated from population two. So now that I've uh, explained a couple of the genetic concepts, I'll get into uh, the research project itself. So this uh, project was set in motion by research previously done in the State Fisheries Genomics Lab by our previous member, Dr. Felix Vo. And he identified 12,872 SNPs throughout the albacore genome. And he used those to uh, investigate the genetic structure in the Pacific Ocean. And what he found was that using these SNPs, you could in fact distinguish North and South Pacific albacore. So this plot from that study uh, essentially shows this uh, distinction. And so what we're looking at here is each of these individual dots is an individual albacore. And this plot is separating them out based on their genetic variation or based on their gene genetic differences. And what you can see is that most of the North Pacific fish cluster over here to the left, while the South Pacific fish cluster to the right. And that shows that um, these are distinguishable by the differences in their DNA. Interestingly, though, there's also a third group in between them. And so these are fish that seem to share their DNA between both of these two groups. So they may represent offspring or hybrids between the North and South Pacific uh, groups. Also, it's a little hard to see here, but there's about four of these individuals that uh, were caught in the North Pacific Ocean, but they genetically clustered over here with the South Pacific samples. So this might suggest that because they were similar to South Pacific fish, they may have originated there before migrating into the North Pacific and uh, where they were sampled. So given these uh, hybrids and migrants, that seems to indicate that there's evidence of some level of genetic connectivity between these two groups. So my primary research goal is to evaluate this uh, genetic connectivity of Pacific albacore. And I'll be doing that by using a subset of over 200 SNPs from the Voe et al study. And specifically, these are SNPs that were most capable at differentiating between North and South Pacific albacore. Uh, 
And because I'm only using a small subset of these SNPs, I'm able to look at a, a lot of albacore, so over 1,000 from uh, the Pacific Ocean. And using this data, I'll be looking at questions of uh, how genetically similar that these, these stocks are, and I'll be identifying hybrids and migrants between the North and South Pacific. So the first thing we have to do to do this is collect a tissue sample. And that's done by using scissors and cutting a small piece from the second dorsal fin of the albacore, which is uh, labeled here. And you'll take that fin clip and put it in a small tube of 95% ethanol. And the ethanol helps to preserve the tissue and the genetic material inside. That way, when we go to extract the DNA later, uh, the DNA is still intact and can be used. And we also include a label inside these tubes, which tell us which fish the fin clip came from. That way, once we actually look at the DNA, uh, we can trace it back to the fish that it came from and the location that it was caught. So in 2020, uh, we collected 394 fin clips from Oregon and Washington. And uh, this was done with the help of sampling collaborators. So we would uh, fill these sampling tubes with the ethanol, send them to the collaborators, and they would cut the fin clips and put them in the tubes. So in Oregon, commercial fishermen would uh, take fin clips for us as they brought the fish on boards. And the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife collected some fin clips uh, during port sampling. So when the fish are brought into the port here and landed, uh, they would collect the fin clips then. And Westport Seafood also took samples uh, from frozen albacore at their seafood processing plant in Westport, Washington. In 2021, we were able to expand this sampling uh, both in the United States and internationally. So in the North Pacific, we took more samples from Oregon and Washington with the help of the previously mentioned collaborators. And I was also able to help uh, some of the port sampling with ODFW by going down there myself to the docks in Newport. Uh, also in the North Pacific, we're anticipating receiving samples from Hawaii with the help of the NOAA Southwest Fishery Science Center and from Japan with the help of the Japan uh, Fisheries Research and Education Agency. In the South Pacific, our primary collaborator was the Pacific Community, and they got us in touch with port samplers and uh, fisheries observers in New Caledonia and French Polynesia. So once we actually get the samples in hand, the first step is to extract the DNA. And so this is done by dissolving the fin clip into a liquid, essentially, and then uh, putting it through a series of chemical processes that remove all the unwanted materials and isolate the DNA. Once we have the DNA, we locate those target SNPs that we're interested in, those 200, and we make copies, uh, hundreds of copies of each of them. And lastly, we sequence and genotype those target SNPs, which essentially means that we read the DNA and determine the identity of the SNPs. And once we have that information, uh, we have a genetic composition of each fish, and we can begin the data analysis. So right now I'm in the middle of this project. Uh, oftentimes I'm working on many different phases at once uh, as samples roll in. And so including the 394 samples that were collected in 2020, we're expecting a total of around 1,500 to 1,600. And of that, 816 are in hand right now, but more have been collected and just haven't been sent to us yet, but should be very soon. So rather than wait for all 1,500 or 1,600 samples to come in and then do one big sequencing run, we, just, we decided to do a preliminary sequencing run of 376 samples. That way we could uh, troubleshoot, make sure everything was working fine for the bigger run later and also get some preliminary preliminary results in and so these 376 samples were all uh, the ones that were sequenced were all from 2020 so they were all oregon and washington fish and now they've been sequenced uh, they're ready for data analysis which brings me to the final step of analyzing the data So here I will just talk about a few of the objectives of the research and the approaches that I'll be using to uh, address those objectives. The first objective, as I mentioned earlier, is evaluating the genetic structure and connectivity. And we, uh, we're assuming that the structure is going to be the same as was found in the Vo et al study. So in other words, that the North and South Pacific albacore will be differentiated at these target SNPs. Uh, notably, we are including albacore from French Polynesia in this study, which were not included in the vote all study before. 
And there is recent, uh, recent research from Anderson et al. that gives reason to believe that albacore from French Polynesia may be genetically distinct from others in the South Pacific. And so it will be really interesting to see if these uh, albacore tend to cluster with the South Pacific, the North Pacific, or maybe some independent third group in the Southeast. Uh, one of the ways we'll be visualizing genetic differentiation to look at genetic connectivity is through principal component analysis. And this should look familiar because this is the same plot that I showed earlier from the Voadol study. Um, this is a useful method because it gives you kind of a, a good bird's eye view uh, showing all of the individuals and all of the data and it separates them out based on their genetic variation. And so once you color code for which region that they came from, it can be kind of easy to look at and give an overall picture. Another method that we'll be using is pairwise FST. So FST is a statistical metric of uh, genetic differentiation. And if there's, it's pairwise, so you look at uh, two groups at once, basically. And if between those two groups, there's high genetic differentiation, you'll have a high FST value. But if genetic uh, differentiation is low, then you'll have a low FST value. And that can be useful as opposed to the principal component analysis, which gives you this great uh, overview. This gives you a definitive number that can be tested for statistical significance. So the second objective is identifying those uh, potential migrants and hybrids between the North and South Pacific. So for example, if we were to catch a fish from just south of Japan that had almost entirely uh, SNPs that that were associated with the South Pacific, we might conclude that this fish uh, was originated in the South Pacific before migrating up here to Japan. Also, if we were to catch a fish that had SNPs that were associated with a mix of both the North and South Pacific, then this might indicate that that fish is a hybrid. And one of the methods that I'll be using to both look at genetic structure and to help identify those hybrids and migrants is a software uh, program called Structure. And so this can be a little confusing to look, out, uh, look at if you're familiar with it, but I'll try to explain it as best I can. So essentially what we're looking at here is each of these uh, vertical bars is an individual fish and they're grouped by their sampling location. So all, all of the North Pacific samples in orange are here, all of the South Pacific are here. And what this bar is telling us is the likelihood that the samples um, or that the fish belong to a second population essentially. So you can think of that second population in this case as being the South Pacific group. So what you can see here is that most of the North Pacific samples uh, very confidently belong to the first population, while most of the South Pacific samples confidently belong to a second population. However, there's still plenty of individuals that fall in the closer to that 0.5 range where it couldn't confidently place them in one population or the other. And so that these are examples of individuals that might be uh, hybrids or offspring between the two groups. Similarly, there are a couple examples here that show individuals that were fairly confidently placed in the second population or the South Pacific, even though they came from the North. So these might be um, migrant individuals right here. Now, the last objective I'll be looking at is to investigate sex-specific distribution patterns. And I'll be doing that by using a genetic sex marker. And so what I mean by that, or what that is, is a SNP, essentially, that we're including uh, in this project. But instead of being associated with a region like the North or South Pacific, it's associated with sex. So by looking at the SNP, we can determine if a fish is a male or a female. And this is actually a recent huge step forward in uh, albacore biology, because previously, in order to sex identify them, you had to um, dissect them, or in many cases, even use a microscope. And so being able to use a simple SNP method like this, where you can sequence them en masse, allows you to collect large scale data on, uh, on sex identification, which is very useful for uh, stock assessments. Now, I won't be doing any stock assessments as part of this research, but I will be looking at the sex specific distribution patterns. So essentially, what I mean is I can look at things like, are certain sampling regions dominated by one sex or the other, or are they more split 50-50 between them? So the last thing that I wanna say is uh, genetic connectivity is a great method that can tell you a lot about a species population structure. It can be very useful, but it's important to remember that it is only one piece of the puzzle. So back in the beginning, I mentioned that genetic connectivity is uh, the, technically the transfer of genetic material. And so 
what that means is that if there's a fish from one stock, for example, that migrates to another, but then does not breed, then it's not actually sharing its genetic information, and that information won't be included in future measures of genetic connectivity. So in these situations, it's important important to have direct measurements of migration so you can actually track that fish because it did move from one stock to another. So it's still of interest to managing. And so a couple methods of this are, are the, like the genetic migrant identification that I'll be doing in this study. But the most clear cut method is still with satellite tagging, which actually tracks the movement of the fish. And that's why satellite tagging is still a really important part of fisheries management today. In fact, the American Fishermen's Research Foundation has deployed a thousand tags on albacore in the Pacific over the last 20 years, including 78 this year. And these tags can provide uh, critical information on the migration patterns of these fish. And lastly, it's important to consider demographic information as well. So things like natural birth and mortality. Because even if you find out that there seems to be a large amount of migration occurring from one stock to another, that migration may just be a drop in the bucket against local birth and mortality rates. If lots of fish are being born all the time into that population, it may barely even notice that more fish are coming in, for example. And so the information that I'll have from this study on the genetic connectivity of albacore should be combined with these more traditional methods like tagging studies and demographic information in order to make sure that albacore are managed sustainably in the Pacific Ocean. Lastly, I just want to acknowledge some people that are important to this project. So my graduate committee members, Dr. Yuan Zhang, Dr. Daniel Palacios, and Dr. Steve Teo, as well as the other uh, members of the State Fisheries Genomics Lab who have helped me uh, learn these procedures and put together the presentation. Um, the sampling collaborators uh, that I mentioned by name throughout the presentation, without them, this project uh, would not be possible. And a few others, uh, Drs. Matt Craig and John Hyde at the NOAA Southwest Fishery Science Center, who uh, worked to develop this uh, genetic sex marker and have helped answer my questions about it, as well as the Oregon Albacore Commission and the American Fishermen's Research Foundation, who have been with this project since its uh, inception and the work by Dr. Vo. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. What a very cool study. Um, I So to everybody out there, if you've got any questions, feel free to add them into the Q&A box or the chat and we will get to those. Um, I always like to kick off this session asking around, uh, what was your inspiration to start studying in this direction? So um, while I was in New Zealand, is the first time I actually learned about uh, fisheries science and what a fishery was. Uh, I previously, you know, studied genetics and didn't know that this was something I would be interested in. And so when I learned about management techniques and then started looking into grad school programs, I found that you, there was such a thing as fisheries genetics, where you could uh, learn about genetics and use genetics to help uh, manage these fishery stocks. And I thought that was super interesting. And so uh, I got in touch with uh, Dr. O'Malley, and I've always been interested in the uh, types of highly migratory species like tuna, billfish, sharks, and things like that, and was able to get on board with this project. It's really amazing the, um, how they will go from one side of the Pacific to another, the, the fish. <laughs> it's such a long migration, it always fascinates me. Um, so we do have one question here. How big are the fin clips, and could the clipping affect the swimming ability of an individual fish? So all the fin clips for this project were taken from fish that were already caught. So they were uh, being processed shortly afterwards regardless, but the clips are generally um, about the size of like a fingernail, so to speak. So they're pretty small. And generally this type of sampling can be done non-lethally. Okay. And that looks like all the questions for today. Um, when will you have kind of an analysis of all of the um, fish and the samples that you'll be getting in from all the different locations that you shared? So I'm hoping to receive the rest of the samples by the end of January or February. And then um, once I'm able to process all of those and do the data analysis on them, the full uh, data will start probably coming back in the summer, maybe early summer, mm -hmm. but hopefully I can have some preliminary results in the next couple of months from that initial sequencing run that I did. And do you have a hypothesis or what you might expect? 
Um, well, we're looking at a lot of different questions, so I guess it would kind of <laughs> depend on which uh, specifically. But uh, we expect to just kind of learn more in depth. The research by uh, Felix Vo showed, like I mentioned, the genetic structure a little bit. So we anticipate to kind of confirm that, but learn a lot more about uh, the specific how many migrants there are like in, in our sample size and how many hybrids and learn a little more information on their distribution like that. Always good questions, right? And there's always more than we can get to. <laughs> um, do you know, are there a lot of universities with fisheries genetics programs? There's not a ton. It's kind of a niche uh, field. There, uh, another one that I applied to when I was looking was there's a lab in William & Mary that does uh, some good work with that. But it is kind of, you know, there's lots of fisheries science labs and lots of genetics labs, but there's not too many that are as specific like here in the state fisheries genomics lab. And you had mentioned that sometimes the fish in the north or in the colder waters are smaller. What would be the size of the a small tuna that we might see here compared to some of the bigger ones? You know. Um, I'm <laughs> not good with the estimating <laughs> the length numbers. I can picture it, but uh, <laughs> that doesn't do too much good here. I would say like a, a few, a couple to a few feet probably. The okay. tuna here are the juveniles, but uh, okay. albacore get bigger than that, and other species. Albacore yeah. is still on the small side of tuna, so some tuna like bluefin can be pretty massive. Wow. Okay. And then, can you discuss the management implications of if the tuna are one, two, or more different populations? Yeah, so it's definitely gonna depend a lot on, as I mentioned, kind of those other uh, factors. So even if we were to find, say that like, uh, in terms of genetics, these are one genetic population, it only takes a few migrants to actually keep some sort of uh, genetic similarity between them. And so if we did have a conclusion like that, we'd really wanna look at some of the more traditional methods and make sure that they were one population. But um, if they were, I mean, it helps to look at those numbers to know, you know, how we how we need to manage them if we're supposed to be managing them as one group versus two groups mm -hmm. um, and know how many we're taking from each of those groups. Right. Um, does the low catch the past couple of years indicate they are migrating differently um, or because of climate change? Yeah, it's really hard to say for sure. Um, Again, the, the low catch this past year, which was like very low. And there was also a lot of small fish found this year, which was kind of interesting. But there's really not a lot of data on albacore at all. So there's a lot of questions that we still don't know about their distribution. It's generally thought that with uh, climate change, they are going to be moving farther north in general. And some areas that actually uh, used to catch more albacore down in California are not, not really catching them anymore. And so I didn't have any sampling done down there because it's just not really happening as much. Mm -hmm. But it's difficult to know what the cause is of this recent uh, in the last year. In the past, there have been cyclical decreases followed by big increases. So obviously the fishermen are hoping that that's what's going to happen here is that it's going to rebound uh, in a big way. But it's too early to know right now. Right. All right, well, that wraps our questions. Thank you, audience, for the great questions. Thank you, Jeffrey, for joining us this evening. Really appreciate uh, you being here and looking forward to following the study um, and seeing kind of what comes from it. Thank you, appreciate it. And with that, I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Hope to see you at a future presentation. Bye-bye. <laughs>